they just do a surgical cut down, cannulate the vessel and inject lipiodol. Then they follow the lipiodol ascend under fluoroscopy all the way to the chest. Now you can imagine that this would actually be a very long procedure because you have to wait all that time for the lipiodol to ascend from the foot all the way to the area of entrance, so whether in the pelvis, abdomen, or the chest. But now we do have an ultrasound and you can skip all this lower extremity part that we usually don't need. And if we can identify the lymph nodes, for example, in the angular region, we can inject the lipiodol directly into that lymph node and make the procedure much shorter. So how do we do this? We use a needle that's um, usually a 25 gauge needle, which has to be thin. It has to be a little bit long so that it can go through a long subcutaneous tract, which adds some stability to our axis. We locate the tip within the corticomedullary junction of the lymph node, and then we start injecting the lipiodol. We connect the syringe to the needle using this long tubing. What we use in our institution is this low float, uh, sorry, low pressure tubing that anesthesiologists use usually for propofol injection. And the reason we do that is that it adds another layer of stability when uh, you move the syringe your needle usually stays at the same location, which is crucial to keeping the tip in the correct location. Remember, what we are doing here is not injecting right into the lymphatic vessels the same way we do in an artery or a vein. We basically are pouring contrast into the lymph node, waiting for it to get absorbed by the lymphatic vessels. So if you inject hard enough, you can actually push some contrast outside the lymph node and get some extravasation. And that's one benefit of using these thin needles uh, it does not allow you to go crazy with high pressure injections. Once we do that, we start injecting. We uh, monitor that under fluoroscopy, and that's what we're usually looking for, linear beaded structures that are the lymphatic vessels. And uh, we have to make sure that we are not extravasating because sometimes the needle gets dislocated, we inject hard enough. And even if we start seeing this linear structure initially, then most of the contrast actually goes outside the lymph node. And then if we can see this, uh, we, and we cannot reposition our, lymph, our, our needle, we can sometimes just choose a very, um, totally new lymph node like we did in this case. And once we do that, we start injecting same thing and we are looking for the ascent of the viadol through the lymphatic structures. We then take uh, floral spots every 30 to 60 seconds waiting for the contrast to ascend uh, in the pelvis, upper pelvis, abdomen, all the way to the cystic structure that we call cisterna chile. Now we do bilateral access if we are thinking uh, or if we're not sure where the leakage is coming from, like cases of ascites like, or, or, or like cases of uh, thoracic duct. We, we want to like opacify from both sides. But if we have like a unilateral lymphocele or we're suspecting unilateral leak, we can only go through a unilateral axis. And this is like just a floral loop of how the cisterna chile look like sometimes, which is uh, usually doesn't it's not always like that. That's actually a very nice cisterna chile that's easily accessible. Once we have that, then the next step would be uh, access of the cisterna chile to do thoracic duct cannulation. And the way we access the cisterna chile is that we use a very long 21 gauge needle, 15 or 20 centimeter, depending on the patient's body habitus. Uh, once the needle is in there, uh, we advance a V18 wire, which is usually a micro wire with a floppy tip and stiff shaft, stiff enough to support our micro catheter. Once the wire is there, we take the needle out, some linger technique, no news, uh, putting the microcatheter in there all the way into the thoracic duct. So the way we do this, we advance this needle under fluoroscopy, directing the sterna chile and going in a one steady motion towards the location of the sterna chile until we hit bone. Once we hit the vertebral body, we start pulling our needle back, uh, at the same time trying to manipulate uh, with our wire through the needle till it actually goes into the thoracic duct like it does in that case. So if you see here, we're trying manipulating and then finally it found its way into the thoracic duct going up. Once we have our catheter in there, we actually put it all the way up into the thoracic duct, the distal aspect of it. And then we start injecting water soluble contrast while pulling our catheter to do a thoracic duct lymphangiography like we did in this case. So here is our catheter, pull it back and inject contrast. So what are we looking for? We usually are looking for a leak and it's very important to get very good scout images to start with so that you can easily identify this globular accumulation of contrast outside 
the usual appearance of lymphatic vessels on lymph nodes. And then, you know, you have a leak. And uh, once you do have that, here's what it usually looks like. Accumulation of contrast into this globular-like structure. You can confirm actually in cases of lymphocele, for example, that this leak is actually within the lymphocele, sometimes by just injecting some saline through the pigtail that's pre-existing and see its effect on the accumulated leaked lipidol, like in this case. And then sometimes when you aspirate, you even see the lipidol coming out of your drain. And that again confirms that this is the leak that is responsible for uh, the abnormality. This is another example of an accumulation of lipidol outside the lymphatic system consistent with a leak. Sometimes we come across this finding uh, called venal lymphatic connection. So there are some connections between the lymphatic system and the venous system. And when you see this weird movement of the lipidol, weird direction, weird speed, goes and accumulate into this tubular structure, you just start suspecting that this is actually going into a vein. And the way to confirm this is by doing venous augmentation to compressing the calf muscles, like in this case. And you see the effect on the flow. Once you do that, you can see that this is actually flying uh, consistent with a venous flow. Same thing here. There was an accumulation of contrast at that area that we initially thought it might be a leak. But because it looked weird and it accumulated right where the IBC is, we did the venous augmentation by calf compression. And you can see how the contrast just started flying away. And uh, very important to identify these venous lymphatic connections because when you see one, you, you just have to choose another lymph node because if you kept injecting at that location, all the lipidol will just end up in the venous system and you wouldn't be able to image what you are trying to image. Once we identify the area of leak, then comes the next step where we do glue embolization. So where do we access? We use a 22 gauge needle and access either the lymph node that is leading directly into the leak Sometimes a lymphatic vessel leading into the leak is juicy enough to be accessed. And if all, all fails, we can directly access the area of leak and then inject the glue there. And the local inflammatory action can actually sometimes seal the leak. Once we are in the vessel or in the lymph node, we confirm our location and we'll talk about how. And then we embolize using the combination of the glue and lipidol. So here we decided to access the lymph node that is closest to the area of leak. And we do a double oblique view to confirm that our tip is actually within the lymph node. Once we are there, we can confirm by either injecting some lipidol like we did here and see how it goes, fill the lymphatic vessel that's going towards the leak. And then do what we are usually gonna do anyway before starting to embolize is injecting D5 at our location and monitor its effect on the lymphatic vessels. So if you see here, once you start injecting, it actually pushes the contrast, access a different view, same lymph node. And again, you can see how the D5 is actually pushing the contrast. That's a different lymph node that we also access. And I want you to notice how injecting D5 actually pushes the contrast outside the lymph node. It becomes fainter and the lymphatic vessels gets emptier. And you have to flush with D5 so that you avoid premature polymerization of the uh, glue that you're gonna inject. Once you confirm location, then we inject our glue lipidol mix and monitor it, filling the lymphatic vessels all the way to the leak. Once you start seeing extravasation or your glue reaches the area of leak, you can just stop and you can remove your needle. What if the leak is in the thoracic duct? Number one, you found, find that when you do thoracic duct lymphangiography. And if you look actually here, while we're pulling our catheter and injecting contrast, we'll start seeing accumulation of contrast outside the thoracic duct actually in that area. And then you see this and you're not sure if that's new or was there before. You just compare back to your scout that you obtained at the beginning of the procedure. So if you look at the scout here, it wasn't there. If you look back here, it's actually there. So that's the area of leak. Then we decide to embolize the thoracic duct. And the way we embolize thoracic duct is basically by placing small microcoils two or three coils at the distal end of the thoracic duct to prevent the glue from going into the venous system. And then we start embolizing with glue lipidol mix as we pull back our microcatheter all the way to the cisterna chile. And you can see how it's filling the tributaries of the thoracic duct there, all the way down there to our access site into the cisterna chile. Well, sometimes, um, 
colas ascites patients can be actually tough to treat. So all what we explained so far is actually about imaging of that part, which is coming from the inguinal lymph nodes, cisterna chile, and thoracic duct. But what if the leakage is coming from the intestinal duct, for example? How do you you know, image that? Some people would uh, suggest internal uh, mesenteric internal of the lymphangiography, very difficult to do percutaneously, and sometimes have to happen intraoperatively, which is invasive. And some people have suggested to go in a retrograde fashion. So going to the thoracic duct in a retrograde fashion with a balloon catheter or a balloon and a catheter, inflate the balloon and start injecting lipiodol. And that is supposed to fill all these tracts in a retrograde fashion. And you can access a thoracic duct in a retrograde fashion, either transvenously, directly under ultrasound, or in case if you started your case with conventional internal lymph angiography, you can direct the thoracic duct under fluoroscopy. Now, all these techniques are very technically demanding, very hard, hard to do, and they assume that the thoracic duct looks something like that. But some patients do have a thoracic duct that looks something like that, which we call plexiform thoracic duct. And you can see how you can opacify that. There is no wire going through this, whatever or however you try. So uh, in summary, there are multiple forms of lymphatic leaks, and we only talked about the most common ones. Internal lymphangiography is an effective and safe procedure to evaluate for leaks. Internal lymphangiography, sometimes even without lymphatic embolization, can have therapeutic value because the lipidol itself induces sterile inflammatory reaction that can seal the leak. Lymphatic interventions is relatively new and promising field. Unfortunately, I was not able to be with you guys today in person. So if you have any question, feel free to email me at any time. Or even better, just find the master in the room, also known as Dr. Ambed Musa, and he will definitely be able to answer uh, your questions much better than me. Our last presentation is case presentation and discussion by